All right, welcome to our last lecture of the entire semester of your career with me as your instructor. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to be lecturing any theory after this, so everything on my videos is going to be all practical based around your terrestrial laser scanning project. So um, this is just really to give you an overview as to how terrestrial laser scanning works and the components that are associated with it and everything that kind of comes with that. So. Um, so this is back in the regular textbook, um, not the special textbook that we had on the other side on our previous, um, our previous class, I guess you'd call it class. So what I'm going to cover today is I'm going to talk about what laser scanning is, terrestrial laser scanning is, what are the, what's the geometry that we are using, um, some of the errors, because errors are always important to identify and know. And then also I'm going to talk about registration of terrestrial laser scanners and just missing on here, I have a little tiny bit about standards of terrestrial laser scanning. So uh, let's start with the introduction. So what is terrestrial laser scanning? Some of you guys have seen terrestrial laser scanners before. Some of you have used them in industry. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so what it is, is basically a total station on steroids. So we can see here, this is, this is a total station, right? So this is not a laser scanner at all. And so when, when you go out to do like, for example, layout or whatever, you're going to take an angle and a distance. So this is why I have my uh, total station in this picture, because I want you guys to think about what does a total station do? So you are using light to determine a distance and determine an angle from some set zero. So just like a total station, a laser scanner can operate on a tripod. And that would be what you would have been using in class um, if, you, if we were to go out and do laser scanning. But it also allows us to do mobile mapping. So what's really neat about the terrestrial laser scanner is that it can capture stuff on the fly and as quickly as it's moving, just like what LiDAR is where if you're moving with a total station, it does collect that point as you are taking it at that immediate location that you were at, but really it's meant for a static system. Obviously, you're not going to put a static LiDAR or laser scanning system onto a mobile mapping platform. That, that should be obvious, but um, well, you can do both. So that's why, again, I have that picture. Also, Instead of being one directional, which is really airborne, uh, I guess it has like two directions if you want to consider it going like across the platform <laughs> and yet like the airplane goes forward. So, but really truly an airborne scanner is one directional. So terrestrial laser scanners are not, they're really three dimensional. So the three dimensional terrestrial laser scanners have, you can set a window, you can send a panoramic view, you can set a, a spherical direction. And so a window is like you just draw a little, little square on the screen and you would say, I want just this area to be scanned and it'll just scan that area, just like a little picture, a little window. A panoramic means that you have a thin slice all the way around or kind of like a window, you know, as long as you need it to be, but it could do a full 360 in, um, in the horizontal direction. And it can also create a sphere, so it can do the full 360, but it can also do a pr approximately, what is it? So instead of 360, it'd be 270. So the, it does about 270 degrees in the vertical, because obviously at the bottom part, it's not going to see that. Oops. So, um, so it can be either time of flight or phase measurement or full waveform. Full waveform is not as common for terrestrial laser scanning, but it can be time of flight, which is our C10 scanner, and it can be phase measurement, which is our BLK scanner. So the, the full waveform, though, we don't have access to at SAIT, but it is possible to get access to those, and generally you're going to see those with forestry, not so much with like construction or oil and gas. So our time of flight scanners have a much longer range than a phase measurement scanner. So they can go generally between 100 to 1,000 meter range. Um, in fact, I've had a student that did a, they were doing a laser scan and they actually captured, because the air was so clear, they actually were able to capture some of the buildings downtown from SAIT campus, which is really impressive. 
So it, it does have a very long range. Um, but the problem is, is that the accuracy is much lower. So uh, the further away you go, the lower the accuracy. So you can see it's about 10 centimeter accuracy at 1,000 meters. Um, but if you are close up, then it's about a 5 millimeter accuracy. So it's not too bad. The phase measurement, though, it is a much higher data rate. So you're going to find that they work faster. They're, they, like the C10 will take about 15 minutes between the photos and the scan. It's about a six minute scan. The phase measurement takes about four minutes between photos and scans, and it does a single, um, like the scan itself is only about a minute and a half. The photos actually take longer. So it's really, really fast. They do have higher accuracy. They're about one to three millimeters, but their range is significantly shorter. So you can see that the, the range is only going up to about 80 meters. So if you're doing a large project, a time of flight scanner is a, probably a better bet because you're going to capture more data for only really the, the difference in, in time is, is lower. Um, and then the more points you have, the better redundancy you have. So these are all for like a single scan. We, they are integrated with a camera. There are some scanners that don't, but you can use a camera to color the point cloud to make it look like it's a real world uh, point cloud. <laughs> so it looks just like what's on Earth. Um, so again, it takes a little bit longer to do those, but that's where it comes from for that. So getting into the geometry, like how does this work? So we have a, a, a point in space that we're trying to identify. We have two different kinds of, of um, axes that we're working with now. We're not having to worry about lasers, uh, sorry, IMUs, we're not worried about GPSs, we're not worried about um, you know, all the other like sensors that we're having to include here. All we are worried about really is a relative data set. So we have our object space, which is wherever we decide zero and the origin is going to be, that could be it could be relative to the scanner. It could be relative to a target. Um, a lot of times we use targets for this. And then you have your scanner itself. So we consider the z-axis to be the vertical line that goes straight down from the, the scanner. The x-axis actually points out the side of the scanner, not where the, the laser is pointing. And then to complete the scanner space, we put that into a, a left-handed system and the, the zero for the Y is like straight out from the, this axis. So it's all 90 degrees. So the scanner will point at this radius. So we're gonna see angles at the radius. We're gonna see angles here. So for example, this point, this radius would be shifted down to here and it's going to identify this range. And then these angles are going to be that, like down to this plane. And then this angle would be pointing over there. So we have two angles and we have a range. The object space, like I said, is based on the targets that we use, so we can also use that. So you're gonna see in a lot of the math that I'm gonna show, we're gonna show an object space and we're gonna show a scanner space. So I is always the object space and J is the scanner space. So here's our spherical coordinates, because that's what we're really working with, right? We're working with three-dimensional coordinates and they're all based on angles and a range value. These formulas should be familiar. Um, maybe the annotation's a little different, but for the range, you know, x squared, y squared, z squared is pretty standard. The horizontal direction, we're just looking at that one single angle, and then the vertical direction, z over the square root of these two. So that's the distance on the background. So that's how you would get those. That should seem pretty straightforward. You guys have done lots of spherical coordinates. But that's how it's getting, sorry, that's how it's getting its readings. So, but you have to remember that these are the measured points. So we have three measured points and we have three unknowns. So we have to move everything around to be able to identify what is my X coordinate, what is my Y coordinate, what is my Z coordinate with respect to both the scanner space and the object space. So then we add this nice rotation to do that. So we have rotation matrices, you guys have seen those before, probably more than you ever want to. <laughs> they just keep coming back to haunt you. And then here is what we are doing and trying to figure out this rotation matrix. So here's my rotation matrix. Here's the, um, here, here's our translation to be able to determine the J value. And then here is um, my three rotations around each axis. So as we 
go through, we would apply this math, and then we would actually get these coordinates. So that is taking their previous coordinates and trying to identify what x, y, and z are using rotation and translation. And, uh, this should be i subtract, this should be to j, not, not ij. So just as a note, it should be with respect to the scanner. Okay. So this, this re real calculation that we're doing is something known as an exterior orientation, um, going from the target to the earth fixed system. So that we can apply that georeferencing quite easily using these calculations. But for you to know that every single scanner does this all for you, except for maybe the exterior orientation for georeferencing. But all of this math, every scanner, it's all built into it to do it. So you can get your X, Y, and Z coordinates when you export it. So there are some axes I'm going to be talking about in the next section that you need to be aware of. Um, just some of the names so that you can label them if you need to. So this is an actual scanner. This is like the C10. I think this is a P40 or P20. Um, but this, is, this looks like a scanner. So there is a handle on it up top here. Um, you've got your little radio antenna that tells us where the front is. You've got a little screen on the side, a little pen to use to be able to do things on the screen. So this is what a scanner looks like. This is one of the big scanners. So if we're looking at axes between this, so of course the, the, these look like they're in straight lines here, but they're, they're not. Um, so my z-axis goes straight down there. That z-axis is known as my vertical axis. It is based on the plumb line because these are all going to be leveled based on the plumb line. So that's our z-axis or our vertical axis. Then we have the horizontal axis, which is along this X. There's actually a little dot that, um, that you'll see on the scanners that allows you to identify this horizontal axis. And it goes straight through, it goes straight through the mirror, right through the center, and down into on the other side. We also call the horizontal axis the trunnion axis. So if you're looking for a trunnion axis, that is the horizontal axis that runs straight through, through that through the whole entire system there. The next axis that we need to know is the collimation axis. This is where the scanner is pointing at that time. So the collimation axis changes constantly. And um, we measure it with respect to Z, and because that's the only thing that's really changing, the X axis is constantly ro rotating around, and then the Y is just going to maintain itself at its zero location. Most scanners have like the bigger scanners, these big scanners like this, they have an option to do traversing, so you could traverse with it. But really what we call free station, which is just setting it up and just scanning for the heck of scanning, <laughs> just going for that, that is really what we do scanning for because the targets do all the work for us, the software does all the post-processing for us. So why are we trying to manipulate more in the field than what we can easily do in the software? And the software is so much faster. You literally take a text file, you upload it into the software, and boom, it's it's registered, right? So it's it really doesn't make sense to traverse through. So, but some surveyors really, really like that. So and and that's fine if you end up working for a company and they ask you to set zero, that which would provide your your Y zero, then that that's fine too. Obviously, some of them are really like really hung up on that. And sometimes we'll do that too if there's like a long line of like one target at one end and the very far end is another target at that end and that's it. That's all you've got for targets. Sometimes traversing with that helps. But the collimation axis itself is the one that is following where that, that laser is going. So just to give you an idea of these different circles, so the blue circle is known as the horizontal circle, so following the X. And the Z axis going up and down that vertical axis, that is known as the vertical circle. So if I refer to the vertical circle, that is that. If I refer to eccentricity, that means that these circles are not circular, circular. They are actually flattened down and look more like an ellipsoid. So they're kind of squished. What that means is that the angles at, like, let's say that this is long, because it looks kind of long this way. It looks like an oval because <laughs> it's three dimensions, but it would mean that the graduations of the angles 
along here are going to be closer together than the graduations of the angles along here, which means that my measurements of my angles is actually decreased if that happens. So that's what eccentricity means. Um, ortho, ortho, the orthogonality, there we go, orthogonality is going to be how 90 degree angle this is to each other. So sometimes the z-axis and or the, the vertical circle and the horizontal circle are not actually orthogonal to each other. So they're not actually 90 degrees and that can also add error. So we're going to talk about that in a bit. So just to give you kind of a picture of what is happening with these scanners um, and that is going to tie into this part, right? So we got to talk about errors and models. Um, my next few slides I have created to drive anybody with OCD absolutely crazy. So <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to squeeze everything in so nothing is like set up like beautifully. Oh, um, you do not need to memorize any of the formulas that are coming up. Um, obviously, you'll have it's an open book exam, so you'll have access to this. But I want you to see the relationships. And as a reminder, with any kind of systematic error model, anything at the beginning of the equation always has a higher weight than anything at the end of the equation. So you're going to see kind of a pattern with these. And so identify that pattern. Think about it. I'll talk a little bit about it and that will give you a chance to see which of these errors may be applicable to your application or your particular um, project. Some of them may not be. So starting off with the first, there's actually three error models because we have three observations. The first one is a range correction model. So this is where my, I have errors in my range and so we're going to correct it, right? Because we're trying to minimize it. And these are all the components that are included. So you see all this broken up. A's are my coefficients. So they're going to be larger here and smaller as they move down the, the equation, like the actual value of it. So here is just an additive constant. So delta P is um, range correction or difference in range. So the, this is just an additive constant. So it's kind of like the y-axis. We're trying to shift down the y-axis um, intercept so that we can get it to zero. Then we have the scale error, which is A1, multiplied by the range. So a scale error can be an impact because obviously range is the distance. So if it's scaled incorrectly, we have a problem. Then we have the vertical offset of the laser axis, which is the collimation, from the trunnion axis. So this is a shift, vertical shift of where the horizontal axis passes through and where the actual laser is coming out and receiving at that mirror, right? So this has to do with the mirror location with respect to the horizontal axis. Obviously, this is not something that is easily fixed with software. You actually, it's a mechanical thing, so you have to go in and have it recalibrated and reset. But um, so that is, that's what this particular, or sorry, just A2 here. A2 relies on this information. The sine alpha is my cyclic errors from optical or electronic interference, which means that the electronics within the sensor can cause problems. Um, there can be vibration, right? So if you have vibration that's happening, especially when fans kick in on the, the sensor, they're going to cause a cyclic error. It's going to go up and down, up and down, depending on how that fan runs. So that um, that's where that gets included. So that's what the this is measuring the sine alpha. Then this is all to do with modulation, right? So if we use an AM or FM modulation because we're using a um, using a phase measurement sensor, there you go. This is it. If we're using a time of flight, you're not so worried about this as much, right? So it's going to be a much smaller part of your of your model. It is broken up into the um, into like a FOIA series. So that's that's why it's all summed. But it is a very small component of the error. And then this last one is empirical terms. So this is kind of the others. So you, there are many others that you could add in there, but they're really, really small. And so they're really kind of meant for like when you are developing and manufacturing the scanner itself. So a couple things to point out that um, are of importance is the range itself obviously has contributes to the error of the range, right? So you have to have that. Alpha is my vertical um, angle. 
So with alpha, if my alpha is causing a problem, so it means that the range and the vertical angle are both major contributors to the range error. So I'm calculating that distance. K is just a counter. Okay, so that's all that is. N is just number of points or number of um, frequency series. <laughs> My brain's suddenly gone on this. <laughs> so this has to do with the, the Fourier series breakdown of the different, of the cyclic cycle because it's a pattern, right? So we keep breaking it down. But as we move further along that Fourier series, the other terms become the, the end terms of it all become less and less and less of a component. So this is already small amount. It's going to get even smaller later. And then we have the other, so that comes in later. So two things are required, the range and the vertical angle, because they both cause problems. And we know that if the, if the vertical offset from the, um, the trunnion axis occurs, then we're going to have a range error as well. The next one is our horizontal direction correction model. So this is an angle, the horizontal angle. See that with delta theta over here. So notice that there's no additive constant, so it does actually sit at an origin when we go to graph this out. But we do have a scale error. Here it is. So our angle can, can encounter scale errors. We have the horizontal circle eccentricity, which is described here. So I just I described eccentricity earlier, so this is based on the horizontal angle. Then we have the non-orthogonality of the horizontal encoder and the vertical axis. So the horizontal encoder is the one that measures the horizontal angle. So it gets put into this equation as well, because obviously if, it, if the horizontal encoder is measuring an angle that is not 90 degrees to the vertical axis, then we've got a problem, right? Because it's not actually measuring it based on the plumb line. Then we have the collimation axis error, so that happens, right? So sometimes the, the axis itself is not actually being measured where it should be. Then we have the non-orthogonality of the trunnion axis and the vertical axis. This time it's a tangent rather than the, um, rather than the what was it, sign in the last slide. Here we have the eccentricity of the collimation axis and the vertical axis. So this is creating a like a 3D sphere. And then it's measuring the eccentricity of that of between the collimation and the vertical axis. So the collimation axis should be going straight down and around in a circle and going at the same rate as the graduations within the vertical axis. But because it may not be, and it might have a bit of a wobble to it, we, that, that will add to an error. And then we have an actual tr trunnion axis wobbler. So <laughs> this whole sum here is Fourier series, right? That's what, just like I mentioned the previous one. And this is like the tr trunnion axis is actually like wiggling around because of like, I mean, you have moving parts, you have a motor in there. You have an electric motor that's spinning things. You're going to end up with vibration. It's impossible to get rid of that. No matter how heavy you make these scanners, they're still going to have that vibration. So this is what that's measuring. measuring. And then, of course, empirical terms. So going back and just looking at this, what are the things and the components that are important? Well, obviously, the actual horizontal angle is important. Then we have the vertical angle, which is also important. And that shows up a couple times. And the range itself also can contribute to the horizontal direction error. So again, counter here, which is K. And that's it. So there's nothing like really crazy that's happening here. You can see it's a pretty standard, straightforward component, um, just additive linear model, which is kind of a nice thing, <laughs> except for like the sines and cosines. But for the most part, it's pre it looks pretty linear. So it's a pretty easy calculation. Again, it really depends on um, the manufacturing component. And this all ties into that again, right? So a lot of these you can't fix on your own. You'd have to take it in for manufacturing. The last of the error models is the elevation angle correction. So again, pretty straightforward, pretty um, looks pretty, pretty easy to calculate. So the components of this is we have this, again, this separate kind of y-axis um, intercept. 
And that is what we call the vertical circle index. So we have to adjust for that index. We have a scale error. We have a vertical circle eccentricity, kind of seems to follow the same as the previous one. Then we have the non-orthogonality of plane, of the, pl of the plane, with vertical circle and the trunnion axis. Again, looking at that. So th those two, that really comes into play. Notice that it shows up like all the time, right? It shows up in both of them. This is because if those are not correct, then everything gets, like all the errors get um, exaggerated. Then we have the eccentricity of the collimation axis versus the trunnion axis. So this time around we're looking at, we're switching it from the vertical axis to the trunnion axis. And that is creating our, um, our, like a full sphere. So we're having to really model that one. This one's a little bit more complex to, to calculate. Then we have mass imbalance. So, so if you have something, let's say you have it poorly weighted and as that, um, as that mirror spins, it's going to be heavier on one side than the other. And if you, if you understand motors at all, um, and not, not like, not engines, but motors, <laughs> you know that if you have a heavier part along an axis, that, that it's going to cause it to vibrate. And so this is causing a cyclic vibration that we can model using mass imbalance. And then we have the empirical terms. So what do we have in here? We have our vertical L angle. We have our range and we have the horizontal angle. So they all contribute into the elevation angle correction. But notice that the horizontal angle is less of a weighting than the actual elevation angle itself, and even less than the range itself. So going through these, these are all specific to terrestrial laser scanning. And some of these error models don't like don't need all the components because certain um, certain designs of the laser scanners have already adjusted for these. So they're not even considered a, a part. Sometimes you, you have no control over a lot of this, right? Because it's, it's all really manufacturing of the laser scanner and they all can be modeled. So the, when, when the, let's say you go and work for Leica and you work in there like as a technician for them in, in their, their department, they might say, you know what? The vertical circle eccentricity is not an issue because our, our system covers that already but you need to model the rest of these. So you would just run some numbers through the software. It would create this, this model with the coefficients, and then you would be able to add that into the observation equation so that you can find out your X, Y, and Z, right? So your row, or sorry, no, just your X, Y, and Z values of your points. So that's where these systematic models come in. There is one more error that comes up with systematic errors. And that is known as a data artifact. So this happens because of reflective properties of materials around, like in your scene, or of the target itself. Um, it also depends on the type of laser scanner that you have. And it also is like, so a lot of these are outliers, like they're not actually data that we want, but they're usually pretty obvious. Some of them, maybe not, but most of them are pretty obvious. So, um, I just noticed that <laughs> there's a spelling error in there. So, the, but the range location, for example, of the, uh, of our, our light. So this is where these come from. So the range location of the light, of the beam. So we're looking at the beam, the beam diameter, all of that stuff still is part of terrestrial laser scanning. So we look at the beam and it's based, like, based on the center line of the beam in theory. Okay, but because of reflective properties of targets, it can be anywhere in the beam footprint. Because if something is has a stronger reflection within that beam, then it actually will knock it off center. So that will cause a data artifact. So you're actually getting a incorrect reading because you're not actually getting the center of the the footprint, you're getting some other part of the footprint. But we can also have multipath, which is also part of data artifacts. Um, so that would cause haloing. So you'd end up with like this really crazy like halo. It looks like circling around a object if you have multipath happening there. 
Um, other things that you can see with data artifacts are like ghosts. I call them ghosts because <laughs> they pretty much are. Um, they're people moving through, so you end up with like these like little things. I mean, really, as a data artifact, it's it has that has nothing to do with the actual sensor, but it is very easy to remove because all you do is like select those points and delete them. You just can't see through them. Is the only thing. But um, but yeah, if you ever work with the C10, you're gonna see some haloing that happens. But it's actually more like noise, and it's like the ray of light that comes down from the from the above. <laughs> it's kind of it, it does look like sunlight shining down on the sensor. So um, that is a data artifact. So a lot of these we can just delete, and so it's a systematic error because we can remove it. But um, yeah, they're just really easy to to identify. If the if the range location um, within the footprint is close then that is part of the error modeling that we also get with the range errors. So we can also include it there. So moving into the next topic of terrestrial laser scanning is the registration of it. So we have our registration process, which is finding our ground control points. We apply a transformation equation, reduce the RMSE to the required accuracy, we resample the point cloud physically, so it's physically viewable, and then you evaluate it visually. These are the five steps to registration, no matter what remote sensing you're doing. <laughs> so this comes across all the time. So you need to know these five steps. This is what we are doing in our registration process. There's nothing different from this versus like what we did in remote sensing, So because we are still doing remote sensing. So our types of registration that we have, we have target-based registration. So we'll use targets, um, place them on the field, we name them, they keep that name for every single scan. So if we have target one, it's target one for every single scan. And what we do is we try to look for the center point of these targets. So these are C10s, so you can see the C10 here. These are C10, no, these are not C10s targets. These are the P-series targets because they're black and white. So the P-series targets, you can see the center point of these, of these targets. What we're trying to do is determine that center. What is really cool about the big scanners, and they will identify these. Like you, well, you go through, you identify them manually in the field. And it does like a super high resolution scan of the target. And then it calculates the center point of that target. And then you can apply coordinates to it and then you've got real world coordinates within your point cloud. So really cool, really great way to, to, to develop your, um, your field methods. And then you can keep those points in the field for as many projects as you need to, or many times you need to go back. And then every time you go back, then that target is in the exact same location. So you can just keep tying back into it. So easy to do, it takes a little bit longer in the field because it's important that you set them up, that you have them geometrically placed. Um, you need to, with these, you need to have different heights. You need to have different X and Ys. So ideally, you want to have at least three targets for every, um, every scan that you're trying to, or scan project. And then you're going to have, um, usually you're going to end up with a few more that come through that. So through, through that project. So generally speaking, you probably want like six targets out there, unless it's like you can see the same targets for most of your scans or like a, a good number of the scans. Um, so placement is really, really important. And you want to have them surrounding you because you need to kind of shape your network around you. If you have them all in a straight line, all you're doing is creating a rocking horse, right, for your, your coordinates. And you don't want to do that. Just like what we talked about in placing ground control points for remote sensing this past semester. So yeah, so we calculate the RMSE and the RMSE must be below 12 millimeters. This is a, one of the few standards that are out there. This is the Leica standard that if you have an RMSE above 12 millimeters in target based registration, then it is not a good registration. So that's target based. Then we have our iterative point, our iterative closest point method. We call this cloud to cloud and cyclone. 
And what this one does is it looks for points in the, the cloud and it tries to match them up. So this is, the, it, it has a master cloud and a slave cloud, which is, uh, this will be exactly like what we did with remote sensing when we did image to image registration. This is just called cloud to cloud. And you know, so you will have your master and you will have your slave and you will match them up and you are going to find individual points so you can see together. The hardest part about this is that you're dealing with 3D. So for example, if I wanted to put a point on this pillar over here, I might accidentally put it on the wall over here and that's going to cause an error. So you really have to be careful about how you place your points. Um, so let's say this is the same. And then the other thing is like the shadowing, right? So here, if I were to use this pillar and I wanted to use this point, or actually no, it would be this pillar here, and I wanted to use this point on the pillar, I can't see that point on this pillar. So I need to find another point. So what I might do is go to, you know, go up to the top. Maybe there's more here. I can't see it. I can go up to the top and I would find this point and this one in the same point cloud. And then I could go down here and there's this pillar here, which almost looks like a person, but it's not a person. <laughs> um, so I could use maybe that point there, and then I've got this point here, right? So you can see that they're, I mean, those ones are pretty close, and I would find something over on this side, like further out, and maybe something on this side. So I'm going to try to find up and down, high points and low points. There's stairs here. I could use those stairs for a tie point. Um, the nice thing about cloud to cloud, you do need to have three points. And with those three points, you need to, um, yeah, it, it's nice to have more. I suggest four in, in your registrations. Four to five is actually better because now you have redundancy. You have degrees of freedom. You're able to calculate your RMSEs a little bit more accurately because now it, it's really tied down to different points. So that's important. So you, some, some software allows you to choose the points. Cyclone will make you choose the points. Some are automated. So it depends on what software you're using. So you use the chosen points, apply the least squares adjustment, recalculate the RMSC. You're going to see that, like, and, and Cyclone is really good about that. It actually shows you the whole process. So then the types of registration, the, another type of res registration we have is feature-based registration. Um, there are two different types. There's direct and indirect. So the indirect is where we segment our clouds into pieces, um, and then we calculate geometry, and then we like estimate everything from there. So there's visual alignment in, in Cyclone, and I actually consider this to be a feature-based registration because we're really, it's a manual way, it's indirect, but you can see how we take two clouds, two scans, and we're putting them together based on features. We're looking for walls, we're looking for shapes, we're looking for identifying features within each cloud. We match those up and then what Cyclone does is actually calculates the geometry and then calculates all the RMSE based on that geometry to give you your, your resulting RMSE value. So um, this is really fast to do because it, it, it really like it's a if you, once you get really good at like moving the point clouds around, you segment it into horizontal and then you do vertical as well. So it does help um, and it is really fast. So that's, uh, that's one way of doing it. The other way is what we call direct. So it actually uses modeling. <laughs> so for example, if we're using cylinders, we can do a cylinder to cylinder method um, or we, we kind of start with this with some segmentation and then, um, and then we create actual features. So you're actually going to see in Cyclone that there is a like cylinder to cylinder based registration, which is really good for um, for if you're doing like facilities like um, refineries or anything like that because there's a ton of pipes. So it makes it really fast to be able to register based on those. So those are the three types of registration. You guys are going to get a chance to do the first two and, well, kind of. <laughs> You're going to attempt to do the first two, and then we're going to do the indirect version of registration. If I, if for example, we don't actually get around to getting you data for targets, then we won't be doing target-based, and I'll just show you the video, and you got to be able to talk about it. 
So quality control of terrestrial laser scan data, this is the last of a little subject that I'm squeezing in here. Really, the idea between of terrestrial laser scanning standards is that there are none. <laughs> so um, depends on like who you talk to. Everybody's got their own standard. There's no like actual like national standard or provincial standard or anything like that. It really comes down to what are you using the laser scanner for? And then you decide on what your standards are going to be. So there are some efforts to try to create standards. So like Leica has its own. Um, the, here's a paper that I found that Caltrans is really working hard on trying to create standards. Um, and they have quite a few different projects about that. And then in LiDAR News, it talks about the Caltrans paper that they have there. So that, that's another one to kind of see that they're really trying hard to get something going. Then we have VIN, which is a company, and they have their own guidelines on plant design. So if you're going to use laser scanning for that, what do you need to have in place? Then we also have um, government, for government report for BIM modeling. So building information or building information modeling systems. And those are really needed down in the States. So the, in the US, they use BIMs for pretty much every public building that gets built now. You need to have a terrestrial laser scan done and BIMs are required to be done. Like hospitals in pretty much every state now need it. Big towers need it. There's just like huge standards on that for to do that. So here's some BIM standards. So if you're going to create a BIM, you need to follow that. So there's that one. And then there's one on giving open spatial data. What does the terrestrial laser scanning look like? So here's this last option for that. So check, check those out, see what they've, they've got to say about it. Um, if you are doing a a capstone project, it might be good to bring this in and be able to talk about one of these that are bringing in the standards because they are really working to try to get this to, to have a standard because it's kind of a free for all. If you have the money, you can buy the laser scanner and then you just pretend the software does everything for you and then you're done. So they, they need to come up with something. Also, like obviously the end products are controlled by their governing bodies. So like if you're doing something for serving, um, like a, uh, for a, <laughs> second, what are they called? Are you doing an infill? DSP? Anyway, I can't remember the name of it now. It's gone. So if you are trying to do one of those where you have to like collect all this information down the street while you are going and you're like surveying the house that they're going to tear down and put in an infill, infill, um, you're going to, like, you need to follow those surveying standards, even if you are using a laser scanner. Engineering, same thing. Like, if I, my end product needs to be engineering quality and often stamped. Um, and so then you can't just, like, free for all for laser scanning. But really, when it comes to the actual laser scanning itself, there's no standards. <laughs> it's still considered relatively new. Uh, 15 years ago, these things like a laser scanner was huge. Like it was like one of those great big speakers that was like 30 pounds to lift up and it was really, really heavy. Um, and they were big and bulky and slow and poor density. They have come a very long way. So um, that's terrestrial laser scanning, a, a brief introduction to the theory behind it. And from now on, you will not need to listen to theory at three conversations anymore. We're, this is the last of what will be on the midterm exam. And after really with saying that, everything else that you guys will have to watch are my videos on laser scanning and actually the practical application of it. So I hope you've enjoyed these, these lectures and I look forward to seeing you in class again.